So one thing I observed uh, today, I wasn't here uh, yesterday, but one thing I observed today is that uh, different communities have very different uh, definition of workflows. So please don't get too excited because what I mean <laughs> by workflows might be a little bit different from you know what you uh, uh, from what you mean uh, by workflows. But anyway, uh, so I'm going to talk today about basically how essentially you know forget this fancy title. It's about how we can use AI and ML to do better experiments. That's the goal. Um, uh, so everything I'm, I'll show today is a team effort. These are the, some of the core uh, members of our distributed team. Uh, so Kevin, Ayana, and Dibangshu are a part of my team on autonomous electron microscopy. We work very closely with Yong Chao and Rama on autonomous scanning probe microscopy. And Sergei Kalinin was uh, the person who pretty much started the entire field of AI in microscopy long before it became uh, popular. So, and we are supported by the Intersect uh, Initiative at Oak Ridge National Lab, which aims uh, at connecting uh, state-of-the-art instrumental facilities to our high-performance computing uh, facilities. And also, I'm a part of a center for nanophase material sciences, which is a department of energy uh, user center. So if you uh, like uh, what I showed today, and if you want to you know, try some of those experiments, uh, AI-driven experiments on your systems, please feel free to you know, reach out. It's uh, absolutely, absolutely free, and uh, we can uh, figure something out. So, um, yeah, so what uh, do we usually mean by uh, material characterization workflow? So a typical uh, experimental uh, workflow aimed at materials characterization usually looks like this. So you have uh, data uh, being collected uh, on some sample by one or multiple instruments. So it could be microscopes, spectrometers, and so on. This data is viewed and analyzed by a domain expert or a group of domain experts who use their prior knowledge coming either from literature or uh, theoretical simulations to decide what to do next. And this could be something like, okay, let's measure the same sample under different temperatures. Or if it's a microscopy experiment, oh, this structure looks so interesting, let's explore it in more detail. So let's gather more statistics about this you know, specific type of defects. Okay, and uh, so essentially uh, it's a sequence of measurement, decision, measurement, decision, where each decision is made under some uncertainty. And typically this is where we use our, what we call intuition, essentially, right? Um, okay, so what if, what if uh, we replace human part with AI? Now, what I mean by AI here, the definition of AI is so, became so vague these days, but it's basically some black box that can receive data autonomously process it, and then its prediction can be used uh, to select the uh, next measurement step, right? So it will guide uh, the experiments. And everything else is the same, right? So in this case, prior knowledge may come, well, again, it may come just from training uh, set, but it can also uh, be, you know, you can incorporate certain invariances that you know uh, 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 of your system that you know about uh, into your uh, model architecture, right? Uh, and so wh why do we, we want to do this <laughs> at all, right? Well, because you know, this, this guy here he has, he has awesome data processing powers. So in case of human-driven work workflows, it rarely uh, happens in real time. Usually it takes uh, a human, you know, uh, maybe days or weeks to proper analyze data and then decide what to do next. By that, by that time, experiment is long over. So how about uh, we use uh, this awesome data processing uh, powers of AI to uh, make these decisions about the next steps in real time, right? So that's, uh, that's the goal here. And I'm, I'm not saying that you know, the goal is to completely take human out of the loop, but this is something that we have explored over the past couple of years. Can we you know, take human out of the loop and replace uh, uh, them with uh, AI? Okay, and not saying that this is the ultimate goal. Um, okay, so I'm going to focus uh, today on microscopy, which uh, is a pretty cool technique that can serve as a test bed for AI ML uh, driven uh, automation. So, you know, I, I will focus mostly on scanning transmission electron and scanning probe microscopy. And uh, I, I won't go into details, but the idea is that. Uh, Basically, these uh, tools allow us to perform the structural characterization as well as functional characterization. So you can 
uh, you know, measure, let's say, position of individual atoms, but then you can also uh, study electronic, magnetic, and uh, thermal properties of that in that region of your sample. And in addition to that, uh, you can also do uh, atomic manipulation, or you can do you can manipulate matter in the at the uh, nanoscale, right? So it both allows you both uh, observing matter at atomic and nanoscale and manipulating matter at those scales. And uh, recently, we um, we came out. So we had a paper we just published last week in Machine Learning Science and Technology, we call it Microscopy is All You Need, where we basically argue that uh, it represents an ideal environment for the development and deployment of the uh, various AI methods, and that it can serve as a low-risk uh, test bed for more complex autonomous systems in robotics, self-driving vehicles, and so on. So why is it so? Well, obviously, low risk, right? Unlike self-driving cars, you're not going to hit anyone uh, and kill. Uh, so uh, we have extensive availability of domain-specific prize and rewards. We usually know uh, what we are after, and we uh, have pretty good uh, domain uh, knowledge, and uh, so prior knowledge. Uh, relatively small effect of exogenous variables, connection to first principles and uh, learnable physical models, and uh, you know, programmable interfaces as well as connection to age uh, computing becomes uh, a more and more uh, common practice. All right, so I'm going to talk to, uh, today mostly about uh, microscopy. So we are lucky at ORNL to have uh, some of the world's uh, most powerful microscopes that can be used to visualize atomic structures in real space, uh, identify chemical states of individual atoms, study symmetry breaking distortions and quantum phenomena, and even perform momentum resolved spectroscopies. Um, in addition to, as I've already mentioned, in addition to simply uh, characterizing matter on the atomic scale and nanoscale, we can also use modern day microscopes such as uh, scanning transmission electron or scanning probe microscopes to manipulate individual atoms and assemble them into structures that do not uh, necessarily exist in nature, right? And those structures will have different functional properties. So potentially opening a pathway to uh, fabricating solid state uh, quantum technology devices as well as probing uh, solid state uh, chemistry on the level of individual atomic defects. All right. Uh, so. In 2019, I think this is the slide from 2019, just before COVID hit, uh, we argued uh, sort of our case for self-driving microscopes. And we pointed uh, out that uh, today microscopy is a primary component of research in material science, physics, and biology with thousands of high AM STEM and SPM platforms. But uh, if you look at what micro microscopies actually do, well, uh, well, it's kind of a joke, but that's, yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, but the thing, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the way that, you know, that people run experiment hasn't really changed much over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and we have very limited options for real-time analysis of data streams and feedback. We have almost no real-time connection to theory. And uh, selection of regions to measure is usually based on an educated guess, right? So you start with a relatively large field of view, and then you say, well, you know, this particular sport looks interesting. How about I zoom in and study it in more details? Well, the problem is it's not very, you know, reproducible way of doing science because everyone has their own definition of what is interesting, right? So the question becomes, you know, can AI uh, be, uh, can AI, AI help with this, right? Can AI-powered microscopy uh, help elevate in, uh, some of these issues? Uh, okay, so finally, here is an outline of my talk. Uh, very briefly, I will describe some of the efforts uh, we um, performed uh, offline, so how AI and ML can help uh, get insights uh, from the already collected data. Um, then I'll talk about uh, what I call forward experiments, which is rapid uh, object uh, detection and action platform. And then uh, we'll move to so-called inverse experiments, where, which uh, basically is uh, active learning in the multimodal setting. And then if I have time, uh, we'll talk about incorporation of prior knowledge and human in the loop. Okay, uh, so we had a lot of fun uh, playing with deep learning uh, roughly between 2016 and 2021. So this was, the, I think, one of the first successful applications of deep learning to experimental data. It doesn't seem like a big deal today, but in 2016, we were, you know, <laughs> pretty inspired uh, by it. Right? Basically, you go from, this is a raw uh, microscopy image on a grain boundary in graphene with some uh, contaminations, and you can use pre-trained unit-like uh, model 
uh, to remove all the noise and detect all different types of atoms and defects and while avoiding this uh, contamination. So that was pretty cool because you know, if, you, if you can do it for a single image now, you know, it takes like five to 10 seconds to obtain this image. So you can really obtain uh, lots of images over this field review. And so if there is some, um, some dynamics here, you can study it, right? So for example, you can uh, reconstruct spatial temporal trajectories of individual defects, then analyze the diffusion parameters, reaction, uh, estimate reaction constant, and then use it as a starting point for uh, comparison with different theoretical models, right? So you can do some other cool stuff like latent uh, representation learning of order parameters, and there are many more applications. So speaking of uh, latent representations learning, we, uh, we had a lot of fun with unsupervised learning. Basically, we have movies, uh, showing some uh, atomic transformations over relative large field of view. Can we compress those you know, entire movies into just one or two uh, latent variables and connect them to some uh, specific physics? And it turns out that, yeah, it's possible. Uh, and the, the, the trick here was to condition your model, which in this case is variational autoencoder, on something that you already know, which in this case was invariance to rotations. Uh, to, disc to help it discover something that we don't necessarily know. And in this case, this latent uh, parameter was connected to the order uh, uh, disorder uh, uh, order parameter. This is still graphene? Uh, yeah, yeah. L this is graphene. Melting or what? Sorry? Is it melting? Uh, so now what happens here, well, in a way, yeah, under the electron beam. Uh, so the, uh, this is, uh, it's a, you image it with electron beam, but you also modify it with the electron beam. And so, yeah, it's sort of melting uh, under the electron beam irradiation. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I, I, I like to talk about atom resolved data. To be honest, uh, atom, uh, atomically resolved microscopy is pretty much what got me into science <laughs> uh, uh, long ago. Now, this ability to see atoms and to move them is, you know, I was uh, very inspired by that. But everything I uh, describe is not limited to uh, atom resolved data. You can also apply the sim uh, similar method at the nanoscale and microscale. Here uh, is just another example where we uh, were able to analyze uh, ferroelectric switching behavior using the uh, same techniques and connect. I discovered Latin variables to an order parameter in that system. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, so, so we saw that machine learning has a huge potential for uh, bringing new insights uh, into uh, our sort of standard uh, uh, analysis workflows. And then we thought, okay, so if we can do all of that after the experiment is over, how about we do it while experiment is still running? and use the outputs of our model to steer experiments. Okay, and uh, so, so the, I call it, well, okay, to be honest, I asked, so I, I gave ChatGPT a description of what we do, and then I told, please come up with some, you know, memorable uh, uh, abbreviature. So it gave me this RODAS, Rapid Object Detection and Action System. I like it. Uh, uh, but the idea is that, again, going back to a standard uh, human-centric workflow, so you have a microscope. This is how a scanning transmission electron microscope uh, uh, looks. So it, uh, it collects uh, data. So let's say a single frame is a, is a 2D image, okay? Uh, so this image contains different uh, type of atomic defects, and there are several dozens of them actually in this image, and there are also like probably a thousand or more uh, atoms here, right? So a typical way of doing it is that you have a domain expert, which is a human scientist, uh, sitting in front of a monitor uh, next to this microscope and decides what to do next based on what he or she uh, sees in this image, right? Now, it takes just a few seconds to collect this image. So, so it means that there are just a few seconds for, for the decision to be made before the next image uh, is acquired. Uh, and so, you know, realistically, you can identify just one or two features of interest uh, within this image, right? So you click on it and then they say, well, let's do a higher resolution scan in this area, or let's go and do some point spectros spectroscopy measurement, or maybe let's blast it with the electron beam and they do some transformation and then, you know, uh, see what happens. But this is all limited to this particular defect. What about the rest of it, right? So you basically, you waste uh, lots of data, you never explore like 95 or maybe even 99% of your data with this standard workflow. So then, okay, how about we replace a human operator with a pre-trained neural net that can identify objects of interest that we define a priori uh, in our data 
uh, in real time, okay? and then uh, this information can be used for, uh, you know, for some action, like again, uh, do high resolution scan, um, uh, make a spectroscopic measurement, do atomic manipulation, but also you might now have enough data uh, to use it to train reinforcement learning agents and so on. Okay? Um, so, but again, the idea is that you know, a pre-trained neural net ideally could detect all the defects in this image and categorize them in different types uh, within a fraction of a second, right? So that's the goal. Okay, what is the challenge here? Well, one of the challenges is so-called out of distribution problem. That uh, the thing is that, that when new data comes from a distribution different from that of the training data, your pre-trained model can fail quite spectacularly. And this is, you probably all saw that, I just took it uh, from, uh, from Twitter, I think. But basically this is a, a Tesla car in a self-driving mode and there is a horse carriage uh, in front of it. And it's, it confused it for many things in this particular uh, uh, screenshot, it confused it for, uh, for a truck uh, blocking uh, a road. So why did it happen? Well, because obviously they didn't have enough uh, training examples, or maybe no training examples at all of you know, having a horse carriage uh, on a road. Right? And here's another example, it confused uh, a moon with a yellow uh, traffic light. Okay, so, so how, how, and you know, if, if you, you know, ran uh, deep learning for some time on your real world experimental uh, data, uh, you probably saw uh, something like this. So uh, there are several ways of dealing with it. The first one, you hear about it a lot these days, is called scale is all you need. And the idea is that you just have enough training data, and so you learn this latent manifold, and then uh, every new observation will land on that learned manifold in between training points. And you know, in this case, it's, it's very good in doing this latent space interpolation, so uh, you know, this will solve the problem. Now, obviously, we just don't have that much data in experiments. Uh, the another strategy, another strategy which I find very interesting and promising is so-called causal representation learning when you learn uh, high-level causal variables and links from uh, your noisy uh, uh, high-dimensional data. But uh, this is still, this is a very new field. People try it on toy data, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. It's nowhere near uh, the stage where it could be deployed uh, in real uh, experiments. And the second one that we use is the simplest one, perhaps, is basically as long as you can distinguish between interpolation and extrapolation regimes and to retrain or fine tune your model, or perhaps uh, let a human operator take over once you are in the extrapolation regime, then it's all good. So, okay. Ideally, we would like to go from the deterministic deep learning to probabilistic deep learning, where we replace our constant weights uh, with a prior uh, probabilistic distributions, right? Um, and then we use some fully Bayesian inference methods like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling to infer uh, posterior predictive distribution and derive uh, predictive mean and uh, the associated uncertainty. Okay, now the problem is, and actually it works, we tried it offline on the already collected data, it works pretty well. The problem is just it's insanely slow for modern uh, deep learning architectures, even not so modern, right? Uh, there's no way, no matter how many GPUs or TPUs you have, you just cannot really deploy fully Bayesian uh, deep learning in real time. Uh, so it turns out that the second best solution is approximating them with uh, deep ensembles trained with a stochastic gradient descent. In this case, we uh, use different initializations of uh, different models in our ensembles, and then we also, it uh, turns out it helps to use different seed, seed for uh, training data shuffling uh, during the uh, learning. Okay, and on top of that, we also do this uh, cool trick called stochastic weight averaging. It was introduced by Andrew Gordon Wilson group uh, a few years ago, where you save uh, your uh, weights at the end of uh, training trajectory of each model, and then you uh, average them. And it turns out that it makes your model much more robust. Okay, and it actually works uh, uh, pretty well uh, for, for knowing when you can and cannot trust uh, your model's predictions. Okay, so this is, uh, on, so this is what uh, needed uh, uh, on the software side, but on the hardware side, okay, if you if you want to run uh, ensembles of like say 10 to 20 uh, models in real time, you cannot really do it on the CPU of a computer that came with your instrument. So you need to connect your microscopes to external uh, computational uh, computing resources. So we work with Nagirao team at Oak Ridge, uh to enable this connection. Basically, the idea here is that the data collected by a microscope uh, is available from a script running on the um, external 
uh, compute uh, resources, which in this case, I think it was, not I think, it, it was a, a, D, a DigiX box from NVIDIA with 16 GPUs. Uh, and uh, the output of those computations can be sent back uh, to control software to determine what to do next. Now, when you work with uh, large uh, data files, which you know you can you do some hyperspectral measurement or you do four-dimensional stem spectroscopy, then you utilize this network-adjusted uh, storage. Uh, so you write it and then you read it uh, from here. Uh, but when you work with just simple 2D image, you can bypass the step and you can just transfer data directly between the, let's say, a DGX box and your uh, microscope. Okay, and it turns out, you know, it, it works pretty well. We can, we be able to deploy it in real time uh, for identification, in this case of, you know, domain walls. So you have the image uh, being generated that uh, it can quickly identify where the domain ferroelastic walls are in this uh, image and it provides some uncertainty, which in this case is pretty trivial because uh, these domains are like one pixel uh, wide, so obviously there is some variation between different uh, uh, prediction, model predictions. And we also deployed our own custom architecture, we call it ResHeadNet. It's a hybrid of the uh, residual ResNet, essentially, and uh, holistically uh, nested edge uh, detector. Okay, yeah. What is the training data? So your, your image and then your reconstruction? Yeah, so in this, in, this, in this particular case, and I'll show you a different example, but in this particular case, yes, it's a, so we took, uh, we took previous experimental data and we used some simple edge detection techniques uh, with human refinement uh, to label it. Now the thing is like, well, in this particular case, it's basically edge detection, right? So why we cannot use like Kanye edge detection? Well, because once your experimental condition change, you will have to manually tune those parameters. And we wanted this to run fully autonomously, right? So, so we, uh, we took existing data, we played artificially changing the contrast and you know, adding noise and such, while the ground truth uh, remained the same. So that's, yeah, so that's the idea. But yeah, it was, uh, the training data come from the already collected uh, experimental data, which, you know, that we used to collect for years uh, before this. And known structure. Huh? And known structure, so collected data. Known, yes, yes. So, so, yeah, so in this case, and I'll, uh, yeah, so um, I will show you uh, another uh, example where it comes from simulations. Uh, in this case, the, okay, when it's, when it's, Atomically or molecular, molecular resolved uh, experiments, the training data may, can come from simulations. For this type of scale, the simulations are just not, do not you know, reproduce the actual experimental structures are close enough for training data. Does that, does that answer? <laughs> but, but if it doesn't, then where you get this uh, real structure from, from some? Well, for, from, you, you don't have any other choice, but you have to go and label them. Uh, well, I mean, that, yeah, there are some ways that you can find some, you know, features with unsupervised techniques, but in that you will still need to refine them manually. So you will, you will, someone will have to go and label them manually. Yeah, it is unavoidable. There are some ways to help, but, you know, someone will need to refine it still manually. You need a domain expert there, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so, now we can, what we can do now is that, okay, a microscope acquires uh, a topographic image of, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, was a hybrid metal perovskite, this is an AFM topography images. You have different uh, grains here, and uh, uh, a pre-trained neural net automatically determines uh, location of grain boundaries. Then we have a, a script uh, that goes to all those locations and perform uh, point spectroscopy measurements. After that, it moves to a different region and everything is repeated. So you leave it overnight, you come back next day, and then you, know, you look at the data and then you derive uh, some conclusions. Right? So it's pretty straightforward, but it's extremely helpful, especially if you work in a user facility. Right? So a user doesn't <laughs> have to stay uh, you know, late nights uh, running those experiments themselves. Okay, so now what if we don't uh, have labeled uh, experimental data? Right? Or maybe we don't have labelers, uh, anyone willing to label them. Well, in some cases, we could um, use start with simulations, right? Uh, and uh, so if, if we work with atomically resolved or molecularly resolved structure, we can do something like a initial molecular dynamic simulations to simulate many different possible uh, structures. Then if it's an electron microscopy, we can uh, simulate uh, pretty reliably uh, those images using multi-slice simulations. 
and then we apply it to real experimental data. Usually what happens here is that it's impossible to simulate everything that can go wrong in experiments, all those contaminations. So you will get only partially reconstructed features, and then you go there and you manu manually refine them again, and then you use now this refined experimental data to retrain your ensemble of models. And you do it several times, and in the end you end up with having pretty robust feature finder uh, that can also give you decent uh, uncertainty quantification. Okay. So this is uh, what happens if you, if, if, if you have some, um, if, you, if you are able to uh, do simulations, then you, you can use them as starting point, but you will still have to go there and manually refine them because there are just things in the experiment, like you have this, you know, like because of the way that the sample was prepared, you end up with having those weird contaminations uh, on your uh, surface, which, you know, there's just no way you could account for them in, in theory. But it provides a great uh, starting point. Do you add some noise? Yeah, oh yeah, of course, a lot of noise. <laughs> a lot of different types of noise, yeah. I do, we do so many nasty things to uh, those simulations. <laughs> noise, distortions, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, 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 and at the same time, we add, but we add uh, those types of distortions that we expect to happen in experiment, not just some random, because there is just no point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's what people usually call data augmentation, right? So, yeah. Data augmentation to account for experimental conditions, for experimental parameters. We just cannot, cannot account for all of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so this is an example where, so we, as, I, as I mentioned, you can use a, a beam of an electron microscope to uh, manipulate atoms and create new uh, structures. In this case, we aimed at creating a loop of topological defects in graphene. But this process is highly stochastic because we still don't fully understand how electron beam interacts with our real materials. And so after, so let's say we want to uh, uh, create defects around, along this uh, red line. So we, do, we apply beam al uh, along this line, but you know, it ended up not uh, creating defects uh, in every uh, uh, point along this line. So we need to be able to quickly analyze position and type of all atoms and created defects in real time within a fraction of a second, and then use that information to adjust our uh, electron beam strategy, right? So that in the end, uh, we will create something that looks like a topological loop. And it just shows how it's done in real time. So this is a raw experimental image. No preprocessing is done. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the right side here, you see a neural network output, which removes all the noise, identifies all the atomic positions and types of different uh, defects in real time. Uh, yeah, so you can you know, do it for many different um, materials. Here, we, we played with uh, um, single vacancy lines where uh, we have molybdenum desulfide. We, uh, so this, uh, uh, the middle row is molybdenum and uh, these two rows uh, are sulfurs. So if we remove a single sulfur atom from this uh, quasi-column, then uh, we can tune locally the electronic band gap. So we played a little bit with it and showed that we have a pretty good degree of control. In fact, so these are individual atoms. So ORNL stands for Oak Ridge National Lab. We can actually write it uh, with this, you know, by just extracting the sulfur atoms along the predefined lines, right? Probably one of the most expensive ways to write uh, ORNL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, so this is, you know, how we use this rapid object uh, detection and action uh, platform. Now I want to talk uh, a little bit about how we uh, can do so-called inverse experiments. So what I mean by that? So, you know, in, in many cases, when we have a sample, we already know what physics we're interested in, right? We want to study superconductivity, uh, different plasmonic modes, ferroelectric switching behavior, and so on, right? And we also know that this behavior is typically encoded in spectra that we can measure everywhere in the sample. So it could be like a size of the superconducting gap, uh, polarization loop area, peak intensity, and so on. And what we do not usually know is what type of structures produce this behavior. And this is what we are after, and this is in many cases why we even do microscopy, right? So we want to uh, analyze this local behavior. And we also want to uh, understand this connection between local structures and functional uh, properties with as few measurements as possible. First of all, because it's just usually really expensive uh, to, uh, t from the time and time-wise and the instrument, uh, instrument time-wise, it's expensive to uh, to run those measurements everywhere. And uh, sometimes, you know, there can be beam-sensitive materials, so you are destroying them as you measure. 
Or also, you know, if you do this experiment under high voltage, you will destroy your probe by constantly applying that high voltage across the surface tip uh, junction. So we want to, you know, identify uh, the what structures uh, produce behavior of interest with as few measurements as possible. Uh, now, in most microscopy techniques that I'm familiar with and that I've worked with, you can roughly uh, identify two major modes of operation. One is the so-called structural imaging, uh, which is cheap and fast. And another one is functional images, which is costly. So functional uh, imaging means that you go in every pixel of your structural image and you do some spectrosc point spectroscopic measurement, right? Once you do it in every single pixel, you end up with having this hyperspectral uh, data cube. But these are usually uh, pretty slow and they can also be quite destructive either to your sample or to your probe. And so the question uh, that we ask is that can we use this cheap structural information to guide our functional measurements towards identifying uh, the uh, structure property relationships in our system, okay? Uh, and so this is uh, the algorithm that uh, we came up with. It was it's based on deep kernel learning and Marcus already talked about it briefly uh, in the morning. But basically we start with a pretty large uh, field of view. Uh, this is just a structural image, which again is very cheap. We featureize it by splitting into uh, patches at every single pixel. And then we uh, define the procedure for converting our uh, to be collected spectral measurements into uh, some uh, scalar target, which could be you know, area under the peak, but it could also be something much more uh, complicated. You just need to define this uh, scalarizer because this is what you are after. Okay, and you need to acquire some um, initial measurements of course, because you need something to train your model on. So you just go to random locations uh, and do spectroscopic measurements there and then scalarize them. Now you have your training data. Then you use this technique called deep kernel learning that was originally introduced by Andrew Gordon Wilson in uh, 2015, I believe. And so what it represents is basically a hybrid of a neural net and a Gaussian process. And the cool thing here is that the hyperparameters of your Gaussian process and your and the weights of your neural net are learned uh, simultaneously in the end-to-end -end fashion, right? So your neural net projects this high-dimensional data because images are high-dimensional data by definition. You have image which is 20 by 20 patch, you actually have 400 features in the language of machine learning. Right? So it takes it, projects it to some, embeds it into a low-dimensional space where standard Gaussian process operates, right? And th the reason we, we, we do this is that we want to uh, have both predictive mean and uncertainty, right? If we don't need uncertainty, we can just use a regular neural net. If we want to have uncertainty to guide our measurements, then we have to use uh, deep kernel learning. There are some other techniques. Uh, one is called neural processes, which is something similar. Um, another one, obviously, is Bayesian neural net, but it tends to be uh, pretty slow. So of all the techniques I tried, this one is not perfect, but it, it, uh, it produces the results, okay? Um, yeah, so you, you train it, and then you applied it to all those, to, to predict a property of interest in all those points that you have not yet measured. And you have not yet measured them because the uh, spectroscopic measurements are pretty uh, costly, okay? And then, so you, uh, you take your predictive mean and associated uncertainty, and you combine them into the acquisition function, something like upper confidence bound, which is just a linear combination of two, or some more advanced uh, versions of acquisition functions like, um, um, expected improvement, and you use it to uh, select the next measurement point. Essentially, well, roughly speaking, you select the point that has the highest likelihood of, uh, you know, uh, hosting uh, this, you know, uh, maximizing uh, this uh, particular behavior of interest. Okay. Um, yeah, so here is an actual experiment that we did. It was a uh, proof of the concept. So we have this uh, plasmonic system, and we say, go and find uh, all the areas in the sample where this particular plasmonic mode is maximized, and then we just let microscope run by itself, uh, doing electron energy loss spectroscopy measurements, right? Uh, obviously, I speeded it, I sped it up, but um, you, you leave microscope and you just let it uh, collect this data, okay? And then, so it's, you know, roughly uh, uh, along this edge. And then we change the uh, search criteria, we say, okay, now go and find all the regions where this, the ratio of these two plasmonic modes a bulk and H plasmonic mode is maximized. The same sample, same field of view, and now it uh, finds uh, that it's maximized along a different uh, edge. Okay, uh, now this was a proof of the concept, and so it's pretty uh, obvious you could probably have done this manually, but 
We then applied it to a more um, sort of advanced uh, setups. In, in this case, we were able to autonomously uh, find uh, different types of the topological defects in ferroelectric materials, uh, which uh, showed a drastic change in ferroelectric switching uh, behavior. All right, so that was uh, pretty cool. And again, this you know, whole thing was done autonomously by a microscope. All we needed to do is say, okay, we want to explore where this particular you know, behavior, uh, in this case, uh, changes. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what we did. Um, Okay, so um, finally, I don't know, like, you, do you have any questions? Because I interrupted previous speakers a lot, and so I feel like you need to interrupt me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, you showed your machine learning model that then goes into an embedded space, and then you yes. train your GP on the embedded space yes. to make predictions. How yes. do you go back to the full space? To, so like select the next experiment. Yeah, yeah. So at the, at the beginning, so because we extract those patches, we record, we store the x, y coordinates of each patch, right? Uh, so and then, so that, that there is, uh, so for each for each patch, there is a prediction, right? Mm -hmm. So you have acquisition function value for each patch, and for each patch, we store the coordinates of that patch, right? So we say, okay, this patch uh, gives us the maximum acquisition function value, and we have coordinates for that patch. So we go there into those coordinates and uh, do measurements. Good. Any, any more questions? Okay. Um, yeah, so finally, I, how, how much time do I have left? Huh? Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, so I wanted to, uh, uh, to talk a little bit about how we could also incorporate uh, prior knowledge and, um, and bring human back in the loop, because why not? Um, so, just give me a second. Okay, so, you know, so far, I, I talked mostly about data, purely data-driven machine learning, where you know, we did not really incorporate much of what we already know, much of our prior knowledge, except for you know, this, uh, like that there is a connection between structure and property right, in, in, in deep kernel learning. But when we start measurement, we already know so much about our system, right? the system that we study. We probably have some, you know, some hypothesis that we want to test. More likely, it's a list of hypotheses because there are usually multiple competing models. You know, different theory groups predict different uh, models, and experiment is supposed to test them, right? And uh, so, how about we incorporate uh, that prior knowledge into our uh, active learning? And we, we call it active hypothesis learning, which essentially what it does is that it augments a standard active learning um, pipeline with uh, a list of physical hypotheses. And so these hypotheses are, um, are represented by uh, probabilistic models. And um, the idea is that at each active learning step, we sample one of those models. We, or you can use a standalone model, or you can wrap it into Gaussian process by uh, making it a mean function of a Gaussian process. And uh, you run Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, to infer the posterior predictive distribution. And then you compare the uncertainty produced at this step to the uncertainty at the previous step. And depending on whether your uncertainty decreased or increased, you either reward or penalize that, this sampled model. Okay? And you know, the rest is just this old, uh, good old active learning uh, uh, framework. But uh, the difference here is that you, know, you, uh, you sort of test uh, every, uh, each uh, model uh, at each active learning, uh, a different model at a different uh, at each active learning step, right? So you, basically, the, okay, the idea here is that the model that received the most rewards uh, is probably the uh, correct model of this uh, synthesis behavior. So, so, so you accomplish two two tasks. Okay? You learn the physical distribution of the physical property of interest over your parameter space, which is what standard active learning does. But you also infer collect a correct model of systems behavior. Actually, it, it's done. In, in a reverse way. You, you first, you will be able to learn the correct model of systems behavior typically before you learn the other's uh, distribution. And so once you learn it, uh, learning this distribution will become so much uh, easier. Okay? Uh, it will uh, help, uh, it will guide uh, this process. So yeah, so this is uh, the, the pseudocode of how this is implemented. Uh, basically, the idea here is that uh, you have a warm-up step and then you have the standard exploration step. And in the warm-up step, we found that it's just it's a good idea 
at least have three to five warm-up steps where you run, instead of sampling one model at a time, you run uh, uh, all of the models and then you compare their predictive uncertainty and reward them accordingly. And after that, uh, you just sample one model at a time, which is of course much, much faster, right? And that's why we do the whole thing. And you know, you can use different sampling uh, uh, methods. So we looked at the field of reinforcement learning and you know, the simplest one is epsilon greedy, but you can also use something uh, more uh, sophisticated. Okay, and so, what are the type of hypotheses that we use in active hypothesis learning? Well, so the idea is that hypotheses don't have to be precise, but they should reflect general or at least partial trends in data. They can be hard-coded, or in principle, they sometimes can be generated automatically. And uh, it doesn't really have to be limited to uh, some you know, specific equation, uh, symbolic expression. You, know, you can use, for example, deep learning-based surrogate models as, uh, as, as your hypothesis principle. Okay, uh, yeah, so we tested it on a lot on uh, different types of synthetic data just to show that, you know, it works and it converts to a, a correct model. Uh, you know, just to make sure we're not fooling ourselves with, uh, you know, some you know, lucky seed, like initialization, we uh, performed uh, many different types of initializations to show that it uh, works pretty well. Uh, so this was done by, for the uh, 1D phase transitions. And you know, then we apply it to something, uh, something real, where we had four uh, different models that could uh, describe the uh, domain growth laws in uh, ferroelectric materials. And we said basically, okay, let's, let's find which of them is correct. And once the correct model is identified, it will help us um, you know, uh, better understanding this, um, the growth behavior. Right? And so this is uh, how this was done. Okay, so again, we have four competing hypotheses of the domain switching mechanisms. The idea is that they represent a full set of possibilities for the systems. Uh, so at each step, uh, a microscope selects the uh, domain writing parameters based on a sample hypothesis and a, a pre-selected acquisition function. And the idea is, which I should have probably emphasized before, is that the hypothesis that leads to the fastest decrease in uncertainty is identified as the correct one, right? which I explained in a more, you know, complicated way on the first slide. And uh, yeah, so that's the idea. And in this case, we saw how one of the model outperformed others. I'm not you know, going into details because it is very uh, domain specific, but uh, this approach seems to work. Uh, no, actually it does work. And uh, no, I'm, we're exploring uh, its applications to other uh, domains right now. Uh, yeah, finally, uh, I just wanted to briefly mention some of the latest work that we were doing. So this is, you know, how a standard active learning uh, loop uh, looks like. And, uh, you know, there was even a paper, I think it was a review of Bayesian optimization technique, which was called taking human out of the loop. Uh, you probably saw it, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, well, maybe you haven't. But uh, anyway, th there is just so much emphasis on, you know, completely automating everything and taking human completely out of the loop. But what if sometimes you actually need human <laughs> inside the loop, right? And uh, and so we, you know, we augmented the standard uh, active learning slash Bayesian optimization approach by uh, adding a human here and basically letting human vote on, you know, how basically uh, how how well the experiment progresses, right? And uh, so basically here we look at um, a human operator has an opportunity to look at you know the spectra that are. Uh, so we have a standard Bayesian optimization workflow. We collect, uh, you know, that guides our measurement and we collect spectra, but then human can actually vote, uh, let's say, on a scale from zero to two, zero, one, two, uh, how much he or she like what's going on here. And this vote will uh, be used to, uh, to adjust uh, the, uh, the, the optimization uh, itself. So, and uh, right, we, so basically what, what happens here is that we just have this additional parameter which expresses user uh, voting. And uh, I should mention that this work was done by our postdoc, uh, Arpan Biswas, and uh, he's also in the job market currently. And you know, if you're interested in this type of work related to uh, human elubation optimization as well as many other active learning and Bayesian optimization techniques, uh, please feel free to contact him or contact uh, me. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's how it works, and uh, uh, this, is show, this shows how it actually uh, runs. This is, you know, it was recorded uh, from a cell phone, from actual screen, but basically you get spectra and then you 
able to say whether it's you know, bad, good, or very good. And this, uh, this uh, ranking is used to adjust your uh, exploration and, or optimization trajectory, which is pretty cool. Now, what we found is that it is very useful at the very beginning of experiments, because this is the thing about machine learning, right? It shines when you have enough data. But when you don't have enough data, you may be able to compensate it with either prior knowledge in the form of some symbolic expressions or just your intuition, because you know, sometimes your intuition is also uh, very helpful. But you need this at the, usually at the very beginning, and then later, uh, you know, it's pretty, you know, it runs by itself pretty well. So you can introduce some time-dependent weight for that uh, voting, right, that it will really take it into account at the very beginning, and then it will decrease gradually as the experiment uh, uh, proceeds. But then, in principle, you always have a chance to intervene. But basically, yeah, at the beginning, you really need to add your intuition and domain knowledge, and then as more data is acquired, you can just let it run by itself. That's how it works. Um, yeah, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that everything, we try to put everything on GitHub, we try to open source everything, and so um, everything I talked about today is available uh, on GitHub. Uh, you know, I try my best to you know, add documentation and keep it more or less up to date. Uh, so, you know, please feel free to check it out. If you have any questions, uh, you can just raise an issue on GitHub or just email me. But, you know, it's all open source, and, uh, you know, if you want some particular feature, then, you know, let me know. Maybe, you know, we can work on it uh, together. Uh, yeah, so, again, to emphasize, this was a team effort, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>